Buongiorno a tutti, mi chiamo Giulia Biffi e sono matricola 2005 del Collegio Ghislieri. I'm going to switch to English now because I have a very difficult time speaking in Italian and looking like a semi-intelligent person, so apologies for that. To tell you a little bit more about myself, after my bachelor and master degree in Pavia and Molecular Biology, I moved to Cambridge in 2010 to start my PhD, and there I worked on the secondary structures of the DNA and RNA called duplexes. But I've always been interested in the more translational aspects of cancer research. And so in 2014, for my postdoc, I completely changed field. I went to the States at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to work on pancreatic cancer. I recently came back to Cambridge to start my own lab and I continue my work on pancreatic cancer, try to develop novel therapies for this disease. So today, despite the very difficult times we are living in, which would require a much lighter topic, I'm going to talk about pancreatic cancer and some of the challenges, models, and therapeutic opportunities. And I'm going to start by saying something that's probably obvious to most of you, which is that really pancreatic cancer survival rate remains one of the worst compared to other cancer types. And so while you can appreciate that for other cancers, there have been a significant improvement in the five-year survival rate, pancreatic cancer patients still do poorly. And only this year we touched for the first time the double digits, but there's a long way to go before to get to, to more optimistic percentages. There's a number of reasons why pancreatic cancer patients do so poorly. This is a disease that's hard to detect and it's hard to treat. So usually patients are diagnosed when the disease is already in an advanced stage, is already spread at metastatic sites. Uh, there's no, and this is because uh, it's uh, quite asymptomatic disease until it gets to that stage and there's no screening in place that's present for other cancer types such as breast cancer and colon cancer. And that's because uh, screening for pancreatic cancer would be quite invasive. Diagnosis usually is through endoscopic analysis uh, mediated by ultrasound and biopsies through the GI tract. And so the difficulty in um, uh, catching this disease early is one of the cause of uh, pancreatic cancer lethality, but also these tumors are highly chemotherapy resistant and highly immunotherapy resistant. And one of the reasons of uh, pancreatic cancer therapy resistance is the fact that it's characterized by an extensive stroma deposition. The stroma is comprised of non-cancerous cells, such as fibroblast, immune cells, and extracellular matrix components. And so pancreatic cancer is quite unique compared to other cancer types because the stroma can comprise up to 90% of the overall tumor mass, while cancer cells remain those little islands surrounded by this blue ocean, which is collagen and other cell types. And so my interest in understanding the biology of the tumor microenvironment, uh, how this interacts with cancer cells, and can we identify tumor promoting components that we can selectively target. And in particular, I focus on cancer associated fibroblasts or CAFs, which are the most abundant cell population in pancreatic tumors. And they have been shown to have a number of tumor promoting components. They are the cell population responsible for the deposition of the extracellular matrix proteins, which forms this desmoplasia that has been shown to act as a barrier to drug delivery. They also secrete ligands and growth factors that promote the proliferation of tumor cells. They secrete ligands that promote the establishment of an immunosuppressive microenvironment of pa in pancreatic cancer, for example, by preventing access and recruitment of cytotoxic T cells. They also contribute to chemotherapy resistance, not only by secreting extracellular matrix proteins, but also by sequestering actively drugs, lowering the concentration of drug within the tumor, which would otherwise target the cancer cells. More recently, there's evidence that these uh, fibroblasts, however, could have also tumor restraining roles highlighting the heterogeneity of this population in the tumor microenvironment uh, and the need to better understand uh, the biology of fibroblasts. 
And so my goal really is to dissect the crosstalk between cancer cells and other cell population, starting with the fibroblast, as we need to understand the biology of this cancer to identify vulnerabilities that could be therapeutically targeted. There's various models that we can use to study this disease. We can collect samples from patients and perform histological analysis, uh, immunohistochemical analysis. We can do RNA sequencing, DNA mutation analysis, and have a better understanding this way of the biology of pancreatic cancer. Uh, however, I'm interested in dissecting the mechanisms and the cell signaling pathways between populations, uh, as this will allow us to uh, determine and define novel treatments that selectively target uh, one crosstalk uh, uh, that would be tumor promoting when not targeting tumor restraining, for, for example, cell signaling pathways. So in the lab, uh, in addition to looking at human samples, we use mouse models. One of the mouse models that we use, uh, it was developed by my postdoctoral advisor many years ago, and uh, but remains the gold standard for testing of drugs in preclinical studies. Mouse models, however, are pretty time consuming and uh, quite costly. And so we also use uh, a, a other type of models such as side lines uh, for the past 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, most lab have been used uh, 2D cell cultures. These are cell lines that grow on monolayer. They can be used to investigate cell signaling pathways uh, and they can be used to test uh, different drug combinations. Uh, however, they grow on monolayer, so they don't have the polarization that uh, cancer cells have in the body when they grow three-dimensionally. They also develop, acquire over time different genetic, uh, different uh, mutations, and so their genetics can be quite different from the tissue of origin. They have been shown to be more sensitive to therapies compared to, drug, compared to mouse models and, and patients. And so for all this reason, almost six years ago now, we have developed a new model of pancreatic cancer progression. These are the so-called organoids. They are three-dimensional three primary cultures uh, that grow three-dimensionally, like a tumor would grow in your body, and that we can use uh, for genetic testing and uh, uh, pharmacological testing. And so we can derive them from mouse models, but also from patients. Simply we digest the tumor, uh, we isolate cells, we embed them in a matrix, uh, in a three-dimensional matrix that's called matrigel, and we grow them in organoid complete media conditions that are rich with the growth factors and allows the formation of this uh, cystic structures that can be either filled in or cystic like in the, this bright field picture. We can do the same with uh, uh, tumor samples from, uh, from patients, uh, either from uh, resections or from fine needle biopsies or aspirations. And they uh, look pretty much similar to the murine cultures, uh, uh, either cystic or uh, filled in. So by doing this, we can develop organoids not only from the primary tumor and the metastatic site, but we can also develop them from preneoplastic lesions such as panin and also from the normal pancreas. And so have the whole uh, uh, different stages of pancreatic cancer progression and the normal control. And so the advantages of organoids are several. Are several. Uh, they allow easy and fast genetic perturbation. We can overexpress protein or knock, knock out genes, knock down, knock down proteins. Uh, they allow a comparison uh, between normal and tumor. This is very important and it's one of the differences uh, compared to 2D cell culture in which we cannot grow normal pancreatic cells unless they are transformed or immortalized. And so this is important because we can culture them in the same culture condition and do genetic studies or therapeutic study. And ideally you want to find uh, vulnerabilities specific for cancer cells and they would not otherwise affect the normal cells. Importantly, they also recapitulate the genetics of the primary tissue so they do not acquire additional mutations. And so we can sequence them, perform a copy number a variation analysis, and look at how was the genetics in the patient sample or in the tumor of the mouse model. 
And there are also purely epithelial components, and so you can sequence them and look at the transcriptum of, uh, of uh, what happens in the tissue of origin. And so many, many laboratories are trying to develop uh, precision, me precision medicine um, approaches in which we, they would develop organoids from the patients treat them for, with uh, um, different drugs, see to which drug the organoid is responding, and then uh, bring back that drug to the clinic. And uh, this, we are still at the very beginning of this process, and there's many caveats uh, that maybe I'll discuss in another occasion, but this is something that's ongoing. However, I'm interested in understanding uh, the tumor microenvironment and how this interacts with the cancer cells. And I mentioned that uh, organoids are a purely epithelial component. And so for this reason, almost three years ago, we developed a novel uh, three-dimensional co-culture platform to study pancreatic cancer progression. And basically we culture in matrigel, this three-dimensional matrix, uh, uh, pancreatic cancer organoids and pancreatic stellate cells, which are precursor of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts. And we culture them in growth factor reduced media conditions so that we can observe uh, the symbiotic interaction that uh, the cancer compartment and the stromal compartment uh, have. And so, for example, if we culture GFP labeled pancreatic cancer organoids uh, here in green and, uh, and uh, M cherry labeled pancreatic stellate cells in red, we can see that, for example, if uh, um, stellate cells are not affected by ligands secreted by the cancer cells or by the interaction with the cancer cells, they do not proliferate. They remain, for example, like this little dot. But if they interact with the cancer cells, they sprout, they activate, they start to proliferate, they, they can uh, um, create physical interaction with the organoids and vice versa, the organoids are significantly affected by the pancreatic cell cells. And uh, this, uh, so this is a great model because we can uh, use it for therapeutic screens, but we can can also genetically perturb either the pancreatic cancer organoids or the stellate cells and look at ligands and signaling pathways that are important for the, uh, the growth of the organoids or the activation of the stroma. And so one of the uh, discoveries we made using these cultures is that actually fibroblasts are uh, heterogeneous. They are not uh, a monolithic cell population like was thought. They have uh, very different phenotypes and different functions. And for example, here I show you that the two most abundant cell population, fibroblast population in pancreatic cancer are myofibroblastic calf population, which is found adjacent to the cancer cells and so this suggests that juxtacrine signaling or very proximal parkrun signaling is important for the induction of this phenotype and uh, on the other hand we have inflammatory fibroblasts um, that are found uh, uh, more distally located uh, indicating that parkrun signaling is important for the formation of this uh, of the of this uh, subtype and then of course we always uh, go back in vivo and um, uh, validate our results uh, uh, obtained using the co-culture system. In this case, what we did was performing single cell RNA sequencing on either uh, tumor samples derived from mouse models of pancreatic cancer or from uh, um, pancreatic cancer patients. And so with single cell RNA sequencing, you can look at the transcriptome of individual cells. Uh, and if we look specifically at the fibroblast cluster, we could find also in uh, pancreatic cancer patients, uh, uh, these two different population of inflammatory calves, which we called eye calves, and of myofibroblastic calves, which we named my calves. So this is just one example, but really with this co-culture system and with the mouse models and the human patient samples, we have now found uh, um, many aspects, under we now understand better many aspects of the um, pancreatic cancer microenvironment. We know that there are different fibroblast populations. There's a 
a third fibroblast population that we didn't see in co-culture. We see that there's a, we found the ligands that the cancer cells secrete that are responsible for the differential induction of either inflammatory ICAFs or myofibroblastic MICAFs. We know that MICAFs and ICAFs can interconvert, so these are highly dynamic. We know that uh, MICAFs are responsible largely for the deposition of this uh, extracellular matrix for the formation of this dysmoplasia, which is responsible for chemotherapy resistant, while inflammatory ICAS recruit immunosuppressive populations and uh, prevent access of, for example, cytotoxic T cells, uh, contributing to the establishment of this uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment. They also secrete tumor promoting components, tumor promoting ligands uh, that favor the proliferation of pancreatic cancer cells. And so to go back to from where we started, uh, clearly the, um, for finding therapies for pancreatic cancer, we need to understand better the interaction between different components. And we have now different signaling pathways that we can therapeutically and genetically target to better investigate how the interaction between fibroblasts and cancer cells, for, for example, affect uh, the recruitment of different immune cell population and of angiogenesis. And the interesting thing is that many of the observations that we found using the co model and other models in pancreatic cancer are actually um, uh, more generalizable to other cancer types and so indicating that we could find common features and uh, that would and, and therapies that could benefit uh, uh, the on oncology field uh, in broader terms. So this is my story uh, for today and uh, thank you for listening and I hope you're all doing well and hang in there. Bye.